She's a real woman with a real life. She's someone you can relate to. Dawn Newton. Welcome to the Don Newton Podcast. I am your host, Don Newton. My guests today are Pulitzer Prize finalist and investigative reporter Candy J. Cooper and one of the most respected authors in nonfiction for young readers, Mark Aronson. Candy and Mark are here to talk about their book, Poisoned Water, how the citizens of Flint, Michigan fought for their lives and warned the nation. You might remember that in 2014, the residents of Flint, Michigan noticed that their water was a copper hue and smelled and tasted like sulfur. Some began using bottled water, but many of those who didn't started to experience rashes, hair loss, and a frightening dehabilitating illness. Still, city officials claim water tests were normal. It wasn't until nearly a year later when Flint resident Leanne Walters sent a water sample to the Environmental Protection Agency herself that the truth came out. The citizens of Flint were being poisoned by their own water supply. Hey, it's great to talk with you. Congratulations on this work. I have to tell you, um, you can't make this stuff up. It's... Uh... <laughs> You, you are it. so right about that. It's like, no, 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 no. This didn't really happen. <laughs> and, right. Yep, but exactly. it did. And what we're talking about is poisoned water, how the citizens of Flint, Michigan fought for their lives and warned the nation. Candy Cooper, Mark Ronson, it's great to talk with you in this work. For those that aren't familiar with Flint, Michigan and poisoned water, tell us about this. Well, in 2014, Flint was essentially broke and to save money, the state of Michigan with the officials of Flint decided to switch their drinking water source from the Great Lakes, Lake Huron, to, to the Flint River. And that turned out to be a terrible mistake. Our book traces the community response to that mistake and how the officials in government tried to stay the course. Yeah, if you think about it, what, think what you would feel like if you turned on your tap and the water was brown and smelly and if you took a shower and your hair started falling out and your kids are waiting in a, in a pool in the backyard and they come out screaming with rashes and you're, uh, you know, and that were the e that was the less damaging part of the water because you right. didn't know that the water was poisoned with lead. And so now to give you one more imagining, imagine you're a mother who's mixing formula um, with tap water only to learn that you've, you've given your infant lead that may be damaging their bodies and brains. And now to complete that, imagine that you begin to protest and object and speak up and no one will listen to you. And they act as if you're the problem and as if you're lying and not as if you've been drinking poisoned water. And that's half of what our book is about. Well, and that's the part that is so startling and unbelievable that that it fell on deaf ears and it was a fight to be heard that's so true yes they were people were able to dismiss uh, the citizens of flint as they spoke up as if as if they were lying or they were weren't understanding economics or they were just making too much of it um and and not 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 being willing to accept what people were showing them, the brown water that came out of their, their taps. And that extended, too, to the, the scientists who got involved. They were discounted. The doctor, uh, Dr. Mona Hanna-Tisha, who found the lead in children's blood, when she presented her findings, they tried to say that she had fiddled with her data or that she was hysterical. And so it was systematic, the way that the state tried to deny each and every piece of evidence that was kind of overwhelming all by itself. And finally, after 18 months, they acknowledged the truth. But by then, the whole city had been lead poisoned. And, and when you mentioned they, we know the state. Who, who are these individuals? Are these 
Who is this that's, that's turning this down? The state had decided that because Flint was in um, bad shape economically, that they would appoint one person, a financial overseer, to make all the decisions about Flint based on c- cutting costs. So that took power away from the mayor, from the city council. All of the elected representatives of Flint were kind of cast aside in the making of this decision. So... Um, once they had made this, the decision, it was the emergency manager, that's what they were called, and then the environmental regulators in the state who defended that decision. Uh, the governor's office was quite well aware of a lot of the problems that were cropping up in Flint, um, and, uh, and even the EPA in Chicago, uh, which oversees the Great Lakes, was turning a deaf ear to most of this. There was a whistleblower inside the EPA who really helped to expose this. But at all levels of government, that's why I think there's been a, it's been difficult to um, hold any single person accountable because you can see it ac- across many layers of government. Did anybody offer them a glass of water? <laughs> Uh, yes, actually, the mayor drank water <laughs> twice on television, and I hate to say it, but President Obama came to Flint and yes, he also he drank too, water. Which was really yeah. unfortunate, but really um, unfortunate. Um, but I, I think you know, Candy found uh, because she was looking not o- not only did she do research on the ground, but she did a lot of research looking at at. at materials that have been released in court cases, et cetera. And there were emails where when people started to bring up the problem of lead and lead in children, one of one of the administrators said, Ah, why are you complaining? What's a few IQ points? As if, you know, you would you wouldn't mind having your child damaged. Right. And and that they actually wrote that in an email. Yeah. And another another email that came from someone at the EPA said, I'm not sure that Flint is the kind of town we want to go out on a limb for. Now, I don't know what that means, but it's it's it, to me it says, let's discount the town. Let's not do anything for Flint. And so um, this was going on uh, at, at all different levels. So walk us through the research, the reporting process, how you got how you got to the, the community activists, how this got turned around. Well, the first thing that I did was to visit Flint. Um, I had always wanted to write about the experience, the day-to-day experience of a cross-section of the community. So um, I met with a lot of different people. I went to a lot of different neighborhood meetings and forums and dance concerts, and I went to church. Um, And then I met um, repeatedly with this group of 15-year-olds, and they really helped me to understand what what it's like growing up in Flint, what some of the challenges are. And then they also told me stories about their friends and family who were having experiences with the water. And so that reporting really helped to tell the story, especially when you were getting into, you know, some of the documentary evidence that, you know, can be dry. And um, what we tried to do was put those things together so that you could actually feel what it was like to live through this while also hearing the uh, voices of the government officials through their um, emails and written communications. What what do you want the readers to take away from the story? Well, I would like them to have a better understanding of just how harmful and difficult uh, the Flint water crisis has been for the people of Flint and the fact that it is ongoing in a lot of different ways. But in, as far as like an inspirational message, I think it would be to trust your own self, to trust your instincts when you see something that you believe is wrong. Don't accept uh, authorities saying, oh, don't worry about that. You know, it, it's fine. If you don't think it's fine, stand up and actively uh, pursue a change. And I think um, Flint is a wonderful story of ordinary citizens becoming activists, coming together across a lot of difference and um, making a change. So there's a, there's a real inspiring aspect to, to the book. What was the catalyst 
that made government officials pay attention? Well, I think the, the evidence had been accumulating over time, citizens speaking out, you know, many going to city council meetings, writing letters to the editors of newspapers, filing complaints with the state. Then a, a scientist came along with, um, with, you know, and helped the citizens to, to uh, do their own science experiment. They sampled 300 homes. So that was an overwhelming amount of evidence showing that this was a widespread problem. And then Dr. Mona came along and uh, demonstrated that there was uh, lead in the blood of children. So there were the, those pieces of the puzzle that kept building. And I think maybe the tipping point was when Dr. Mona presented her findings. Um, even those were disputed by the state, but the Detroit Free Press did their own analysis of the, of the numbers and supported her work. So, but that was 18 months after the water switch. So it took quite a long time for the authorities to admit to their error. I would add that, you know, something that Candy really described very well is that initially, this was reported on from early on, but for a long time, the way the press reported it is one from this side, one from that side. So you have an angry mother and you have a seemingly sober and rational um, official. And it was as if what each of them had to say were equally important, but they weren't. Right. One person was speaking a truth, and the other person was covering up, dissembling, and lying. And I think right. even now in, in the COVID crisis, there is science, there is medicine. That is not to be given the same weight as, uh, as, as people who are dismissing science and medicine and just saying whatever they feel like saying. Those two are not equivalent. And I think one thing that Flint showed us is the crucial importance of listening to science and not treating ideology or politics as if it has the same weight as science and medicine. There's nothing worse than feeling that you're non-essential or invisible. Right. And, you know, we want right. to trust our powers that be. I mean, and that goes everywhere from when we're kids to our teachers to not only our parents, government officials, right. our churches, you know. So that critical thinking, sitting back and taking a look at it, encouraging that. And I know this book certainly does that. It, it stopped me in my tracks and, and I'm an adult. <laughs> and, uh -huh. um, you know, getting that information and being able to have those conversations with, with our young adults, too, and encouraging them to, to do critical thinking and to kind of question some of the behaviors that we're right. seeing out in the world today. Yeah. Right. It, 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 young people are doing that, but the more we can encourage it, the better. You know, I do a lot of school visits, and I always say to the young people, get a little uh, pad of, of, of sticky notes and put right on it, how do you know? And every time you read something in a book and every time your teacher tells you something, say, well, how do you know? Things aren't true because they're told to you. They're true because you've researched them and found evidence, and you as a young person have every right to question what's told to you, to seek evidence, and to look for more information. And that's, I think, something we need to stress at all times. Yeah, I think the, um, our book coming out six years after this started has the benefit of um, being able to look retrospectively at how people did speak up from the very first day and how they were ignored. I don't know if you could actually see that happening in the moment. Certainly, Flint residents felt it, but when you look at it retrospectively and how the government was responding, it really shows um, one of uh, one of the people in the book describes how she felt like this cartoon character who was speaking and out and nothing was coming out of her mouth. It, no one no one would hear her and no one would listen. And that that was, I think, what you can see very plainly looking backwards. It's like that nightmare that we all have at some time. Exactly. 
Yes, exactly. You know, you're, you're screaming, something's coming after you, but nothing is coming out. So I, uh, exactly. yes, that's exactly what that is. Well, the book is Poisoned Water, Candy Cooper, Mark Aronson. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Where can we find the book and learn more about your work? It's anywhere books are sold, you can find it. Um, there is more information on the Bloomsbury, that is the publisher's website. And uh, I, I hope uh, your readers take a look at it and, and see see how it speaks to them. Well, again, I appreciate this time and I appreciate this work. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the Don Newton Podcast. I'd also like to thank my special guests, authors Candy J. Cooper and Mark Aronson for their work and book, Poisoned Water, How the Citizens of Flint, Michigan Fought for Their Lives and Warned the Nation. For more information, you can visit bloomsbury.com and be sure to check out my website, donnewton.org. The Don Newton Podcast is written produced and hosted by Don Newton. Okay.